Good morning, everybody. It is so good to see all of you. I'd like to just say happy Father's Day to all the fathers. Um, if you haven't gotten, I just a little announcement. We got this little thing here. It's 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 nothing big, but it has a funny little joke to it. It says, "No butter pop than you." So. Happy Father's Day. If you didn't get one, make sure you get one after the service as well, just for a, a nice little smile for the day. Also, I wanted to just, as a reminder, because of Father's Day, we bumped cookie hour in the business meeting to next week instead of this week. So just a reminder, next week we will have a cookie hour and we'll have a business meeting as well following that. Was there anything else I may have missed? Oh, there we got um, Ashton and CJ. They just got back from the First Cove Christian Camp, so we got a few um, slides to, to see from that. And we should announce that Josiah got camper of the week. Yes, Josiah got camper of the week, which I believe doesn't that um, give him a a discount for next year and and that kind of thing. So that's good. Oh, we'll find a way for him to memorize some. <laughs> but yes, we are so glad that Josiah was able to do that. And here's some pictures for you to see of everything that was going on. And from what I gathered, it was a really good camp. Um, they had a really good time getting to know Jesus and getting closer to the Lord. And everybody got home safely. That was the, the important thing. So, And now I am not all alone with my two kids who had they they actually did a better job of watching me than me them they kept me in line so i'm so glad to, that everybody is back were there any other announcements i may have missed okay before we start as with the praise team and we we start um i would like to just um take a moment to do kind of a, a special prayer for dick and karen things are coming up he has been doing better. He had a little bit of a bad bout last night where he wasn't able to breathe. Am I correct? With, with last night. However, with the infection, things are looking better. Wednesday is supposed to be um, the time when the surgeons will figure out exactly when he can do surgery and all of that. So as we open with prayer, will you please stand? And I'm going to pray for Dick and Karen and their family that's traveling trying to get to Spokane. And then we'll thank the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you and we just ask, Lord, that um, you have heard our prayers about Dick and Karen. Um, this has been going on for quite a few weeks now, Lord, and we, we are just asking, he's in Spokane right now, we ask that your healing hands will be upon him, that your peace and your comfort will be with both Dick, Karen, and the rest of the family. And Father, I pray that you would be with all the family that I know they're trying to get down here um, to be able to support Dick during this um, surgery, um, lots of people traveling from faraway places. I just pray, Lord, for safeties and traveling, and that you will be with that entire family, Father. We love them both, and we know that you do as well. Father, I also just want to say thank you for this great opportunity to, to come together today to honor um, not only our earthly fathers, but you, Father, ultimately as our heavenly Father, to worship you, to give you praise. We just pray, Lord, that it will be pleasing coming up to you, that you will be here in our midst, and that you will work in our hearts, our minds, and our soul in some way today to draw us closer to you in relationship. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, you want me to do it? Okay. Psalm 143. Five, three, great is the Lord, and great he will be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. Please, oh, I think we're just <laughs> Oh. 
Psalm 86, 8. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, nor are there any works like yours. O oh Lord, be gracious to us, we wait for you, be our arm for every morning, our salvation in the time of trouble.
children's story next. Come on up, kids. Okay. I will. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, glad you guys came up. Happy Father's Day, fathers. That's right. I want to talk to you about God because God is our Father and He teaches our fathers how to be good fathers to us, right? Mm -hmm. And so, when I was trying to figure out what to talk about, Karen Temple got all the fathers' um, flashlights. So I'm supposed to talk about fathers and light. So where do you start with that, right? You go to the beginning. What did God say, first thing in the Bible, in Genesis? What did he say? Let there be light. Exactly. Before he even made anything, he started out and he said, let there be light. And then he saw that it was, and then he separated the light from the darkness. They don't mix at all, ever. Bible says that God is light and in him there is no darkness and no shadow. And Jesus said, I'm a reflection of God the Father and I am the light of the world, right? So what I like to do with God, because Jesus spoke in parables and God has built parables into this whole world for t to teach us lessons. So I ask him all the time to show me something in this world that I can learn a lesson from him about how to live my life. So one of the things he showed me about light, when we were in the Dalles, I went by a building and it said, red light therapy. Never heard of it. So I looked it up and and I got to thinking there are different frequencies of light, just like the rainbow is different colors. Blue has a very short frequency. And in the morning, we see more blue light. And blue light causes our minds and our bodies to wake up. And then in the evening, we see more red light. And that helps our brains shut down. It, it sets off a chemical reaction that helps us get ready to sleep. There are so many different characteristics of God that we can get just from looking at light. There is a light that sanitizes things and kills germs that make us sick. There's a light that just helps us see. Light? That's right. So we can see, so if we go camping and it gets dark, we need a flashlight so we don't trip and fall, right? And if we do trip and fall, our good dad comes and he helps us up. If we skinned our knee, what's he do? That's right. He shines a light on it to see if there's dirt, and he washes the dirt out, right? He cleanses it. That's what God does with us. And then he, he bandages it up, puts something on it, and protects it, and then helps us walk back so we can rest till we feel better, right? That's what God does with us. He shines the light on our path, and he calls us to be light in this world. You know, I, I saw this beautiful picture this man took like four years to get just right of a statue of Jesus with his arms like, like this, and the moon was right behind it, so it looked like Jesus was holding up the moon, you know. And uh, I always talked to God and said, God, I'm so glad, you know, we're supposed to be like the moon and reflect your light. But you know what? He didn't call us to be the moon. He called us to be the light in the morning when I get up and I'm outside in the morning and, and the sun is shining and, and it's just the right warmth on my skin. And I say, oh God, thank you for the light so I can see all the beautiful things around me and I can feel it on my body. And you know what? That light goes into my body and it makes vitamin D that keeps me healthier. There's so many things that God has built into this world and into light for us that we don't even realize. When I was long, young like you, I had a really hard time getting out of bed. And I would get in big trouble because I was so tired, more tired in the morning than I was at night. And I had problems with being sad all the time. When I got older, my doctor said, gave me a special light to sit in front of. And it realigned my natural body clock. 
And so when I would wake up in the morning, my body wasn't heavy anymore, and it helped me with that sadness. And that was brought about by the light. And that's what God does for us. He, he shows us what's in our path. He tells us that he's the, the light that lights our feet, and he lights our path. And I always thought about that too. And I'm like, Lord, how can I think about that? What do you mean? A light unto my feet and a lamp a lamp into my and a light into my path. Well, I'm driving down the road at night, and my headlights shine the light right in front of my my car, so I can see right where I'm going. But those reflectors, that shows me where the road's twisting to, and that's how I kind of like to think of that. So, I want you to ask God to show to help you, and you watch your dad, and you just kind of. Keep your eye on him and see all of the nice things that he does for you that you've never noticed before. And then thank him for it. And he calls us to be light. And in where we live, we are each a different wavelength of light in the body of Christ. So some of us are for healing. Some of us are for teaching. Some of us are for showing people how to to get out of the darkness and come into the light like an evangelist, right? So just keep the lessons in mind and then look up light in the Bible and see what God has to show you. Okay? Okay. Thank you. And, oh, he, oh, we were looking for flashlights and we found them. So would you guys be nice and pass these out to the, the gentlemen? In the church, just take the box. We go. There you go. There you. Go. Thank you. Psalm 8, 4, and 5. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor. Please stand. Please stand.
Today, Jewish people say an ancient prayer before they eat. This prayer says, Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. <clears throat> Dr. David Heldenbergard, Swedish scholar and translator, said that Jesus used this prayer when he fed the 5,000. God indeed gives life <clears throat> sustaining bread as he gives the manna in the wilderness. By contrast, the bread of Jesus offered was given by the Father to provide eternal life. Note that Jesus was giver of the bread of life. In John 6:51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give in my flesh which I give for life of the world. In John 6, 53 through 55, when Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood have eternal life, and I will raise him up in the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. The Jewish people who heard these say, this, this is about eating the flesh, and said, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? The Jewish people were forbidden to eat any blood. We know that Jesus did not mean literally, but used a metaphor, and lots of them that were following Jesus did not understand the, and follow him no more. If you <clears throat> note in Leviticus 17, 10 through 11, verse 10, forgets, forget, forbids eating of blood, but in verse 11, it explains that in the blood that makes atonement for sin, which Jesus did on the cross. As we know, this is the reference to the Passover table where the Jewish people eat unleavened bread and drink wine during the Passover. In 1 Corinthians 11, 24 through 25, <clears throat> Jesus said, When he had given thanks, he broke and said, Take this, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant of my blood. This do, and often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. By this, he said, he instituted what we know now is, is communion. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, thank you for bringing us here this morning, Lord, and open our eyes to your word and give you praise always. In Jesus' name, amen.
Good morning. And once again, happy Father's Day. That's why I got my flower here. The girls made me a nice little flower to have. Brings joy to my heart. And I'm hoping today we'll be able to walk away understanding just a little bit more of what it really means to be a father, but not just a father. Um, Really, everything here can help us all in one way or another, but I found in preaching today, it once shared how after multiple fights at Southwood High School in Shreveport, Louisiana, resulted in the arrest of 23 students. See, after that, a group of about 40 dads stepped up to put a stop to all that violence. It's known as dads on duty. The men worked shifts, so there was always several fathers on campus from the time the students first arrived to when they go home for the day. The dads are there to lift up spirits, tell jokes, um, dole out advice, things like that, and, and just let the kids know that there is someone out there looking out for them. Michael Lafetti said he started dads on duty because we decided the best people who can take care of our kids are us. Since the group formed, there have been no fights on the campus with one student even explaining, the school has just been happy and you can feel it. Dads on duty will have a permanent presence in um, Southwood High School and the group of dads, that they're, they're hoping to see many more different chapters across the country form. And isn't what this story says so true? We need more fathers willing to get involved with, within their families in today's age. This short story is a perfect example of what it looks like to be involved as a godly father and, and what we all as dads um, should be striving for. In fact, these men cared so much for the well-being of their kids that, that God was able to fundamentally change the dynamic of this high school that they were doing this in. Today, we're going to be focusing on some similar truths as we dive into the role a father truly has in the lives of not just his kids, but his family and the church as well. You see, the, the fact is, just as the fathers in the story came to understand that there, there is a battle raging on for the souls of our families. Likewise, today, Satan is trying the best he can to draw as many people to him as possible. That is why for today, I'd like to focus on the fact that, that we all as Christians, especially as fathers, need to take a step back from all the distractions in life so that we can all be prepared for the battle. So if you haven't already, will you please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to be starting in verse 13. However, before we start reading today, I would just like to say this text right here, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14, it's going to be our main scripture for today. However, as we dive deeper into these two verses, we will also be drawing on quite a few other scriptures as well to help us fully flesh out everything. So with that being said, 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14 says, be on the alert, stand firm in faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. Pretty straightforward. And so as the backdrop, this text perfectly embodies what a faithful and godly father looks like. For you see, yes, a father is to be alert. A father is to stand firm in the faith, acting like a man as God designed us to be, while at the same time standing strong, never forgetting that that love is at the very heart of everything we do. Now, with that being said, it's important to mention that, that though our focus will be primarily on fathers, the fact is, as I had alluded to earlier, each point today can and does apply to all of us, both male and female, young and old, as Christians. Which leads me to the first key point for today, which if we were to take all the characteristics of 1 Corinthians 16, 13, and 14 and narrow in on the heart of what is being said, we first come to see that fathers must be a threat. 
Let me say that again. Fathers must be a threat. Now, you might be wondering why I specifically chose that wording. For as Christians, Jesus calls us to display our love first and foremost in all that we do, which that is definitely true. However, we also learn that we are in a dangerous and lethal world as we live in this life. And sadly, a lot of the casualties that happen in this war come from our very own families. So in order to fully flesh out our first key point for today, it's crucial that we first jump all the way over to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 18, which says, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in this heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm, therefore having gird your loins with the truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having sawed your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the enemy one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit and with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and Petition for all the saints. That described right there means we're in a war. And so here we see that Paul makes a slight change in his tone from the rest of Ephesians, of, in which his tone becomes very militant in nature. As he teaches that, that we as God's followers, we as the church, especially as fathers, are most certainly caught up in a battle against evil. Paul expresses to us that that we need to courageously resist evil through God's strength while being prepared to endure and resist the enemy's attacks while also protecting others. So when it comes to being a father, if we were to boil down the heart of what Paul is getting at here, it would be that as a Christian father, because we are at war, we need to be prepared, we need to be a threat because of Jesus in our lives towards the enemy so that we can properly and faithfully protect not only our wives, our children, but also our fellow brothers and sisters in the church when the time comes. Simply put, as Paul is expressing here in these verses, that as God's church and as good fathers, we are to be strong in the Lord. Have you heard any of that said recently in society? In fact, you don't hear much of it at all. If anything, it says, hey men, how about you become little, little weak things over in the corner? See, it's safe to say that all Christians everywhere are to be strong in the Lord because we are all a part of the universal body of Christ from the formation of church back in Acts all the way up to today, all who make Jesus Lord of our lives are now soldiers in God's army. As soldiers of God, it is vital that we understand and embrace the tools required for us as God's church to be successful, especially when it comes to a father's role in the church and our family's lives. We as fathers are called to be warriors in God's kingdom, protecting and defending others from the schemes of the enemy as shown by Paul in verse 11. The devil is continually scheming against us. The devil is looking for opportunities to destroy our families, our wives, and our kids. Therefore, it's crucial that a godly father must be a threat. We must step up to the call of being protectors for the weak and the innocent, especially within the church and our families. We must be so connected to the Lord in faith that when the enemy looks at us, he shudders in fear, knowing that we will do whatever it takes to see that nothing and nobody harms anyone in the family of God, especially our very own wives and kids. Have you ever thought of that, that we're actually called to be warriors? 
The devil should look at us and Jesus being so bright in our lives that all they see is him when, when he looks at us and he says, nope, not going there. So to help us do this, to help us to be a threat to the evil forces, we see that Paul urges us to put on the armor of God. Because only God's armor is what gives us any true defense. Only God's armor prepares us for the battle. Only God's armor gives us a weapon. But what are we defending against? Well, in verse 12, we see that it says, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of the wickedness in the heavenly places. That sounds spooky. It'd be so much easier just to fight a person. But we're called to fight a battle that's much larger, and it's all around us. We are at war with not people, but we are truly at war with the spiritual forces of evil. Though, don't get, here, get me wrong, it is true that people can most certainly be used by the enemy. We see it constantly, in which we always need to be ready to protect others from harm, yes. We also need to be willing to see, though, that those other people that are being used by the enemy, they are captives to Satan. Being manipulated, being used in ways in which they are also like many of us were at one point needing to be saved and freed from the icy grips of death. Our real battle isn't against just flesh and blood. It is against the spiritual forces that can manipulate others into doing and manifesting into, sadly, sometimes really real physical as well as spiritual dam damage. We see this raging constantly in society now. So we must be prepared and, and ready to act as Christ calls us. And here Paul states that Jesus wants us to be strong. But what does this mean to be strong? What does it mean? Well, a good way to look at this would be my coffee cup. Right? I can stick this coffee cup out, and this is my bad shoulder too, and I can hold it, right? All by myself. However, eventually, if I were to stand here like this, eventually, it would begin to drain my strength. And it would begin to get very heavy. Eventually, I'd be shaking just to hold it. In time, even this little weight of coffee in a mug would become extremely heavy as I weaken. Eventually, I would have to put it down. But when we put God's full armor on, the strength of God helps us to become like an impenetrable force, never weakening, never giving in to the opportunities of the enemy. He can't get through to us because God's power is the weight behind us. And God's weight never gets too heavy for us to carry. Remember he says, my burden is light. As it says in James 4, 7, submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. I like that because it's very simple, but if you, if you notice, there's one specific word. It says, submit to, to God. That's good. That makes sense. Resist the devil. That makes sense. And he will flee from you. Do you ever remember um, Job? And the enemy comes up and says, oh, yeah, he's not that good. And God says, okay, I'll let you test him a little bit here, but you will not do this. And that goes on multiple times. God's in complete control. He says, if we submit, therefore, to God and resist the devil, he will flee from you. The point of this illustration is to show that, that when we all submit to the power of God as his church as fathers, when we let the Lord be our strength, we become a threat. And we become a threat that's so strong and effective that Satan can do nothing but run. Have you ever thought of it that way? 
So often the world wants you to think that, that Satan's actually more powerful than God. Nothing you can do can stop the evil forces. Just look at any of those scary movies that deal with possessions or any of that kind of stuff. That's always how they, they end up looking, is you can't stop this. Even when there's a godly man that says, no, nah, in Christ's name, you're getting out of here. See, we are a threat, but the enemy doesn't want you to think you are to be a threat. God's strength is the strength we put on. We are not to be relying on our own abilities to get through. Eventually, our own strength will fail. But when we put on the armor of God, his strength is with us. And God is eternal. God is everlasting. God is unending. He always has been. He always will be. That power is with you. So as fathers, it's crucial to daily gird your loins with truth. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Sod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Taking up your shield of faith. The helm of salvation. And the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Because only when we are prepared and ready for battle do we truly become a threat to the enemy. If we're lazy and not doing anything, what kind of a threat can we be? Only when we prepare for battle can we properly protect our families as well as the church from a corrupt and evil world that is desperately trying to lead our families and those within the church away. It is our responsibility as fathers to stand in the gap between the world and our families. We protect them so that they can grow up faithfully in the Lord. If the, the world viewed us fathers, even just us Christians, as a threat, they would not be so inclined to try to manipulate and corrupt those we love. For as Jesus once said in Mark 3.27, but no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his proper, property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Yes, I know he was talking about him actually coming in and plundering Satan's house. But that also works both ways. If you're a threat and ready for battle, if you have the full armor of God on, we can't be bound by the enemy. When we put that full armor of God on, fathers, we become a threat. So just like any thief trying to break into our house, when you're ready for it, you're gonna pull out your gun. Spiritually speaking, we do the same thing when we put the armor of God on. We pull out our gun and say, not this house. It's because of the Holy Spirit living in us that evil runs in fear. Fathers, when we choose to put on the full armor of God and become a threat, that is when we can properly live out 1 Corinthians 16, 14, and 13 and what it calls us to do. However, that's not the only thing that we can learn. The second key point I'd like to draw out is the fact that fathers need to be present in your children's lives. So just as we learned on Mother's Day how important and crucial a mother's role is to be present in her children's lives today, on Father's Day, we also learned that children need their fathers to be fully invested and present as well. Now, this concept of being present in our children's lives is, is repeated again and again in Scripture. Take, for example, Proverbs 22, 6, which says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Or Deuteronomy eleven nineteen, you shall teach them to your sons, talking of them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you rest. The, the things they're supposed to be teaching, this is referring to God's law and his statutes. Even in the New Testament, Ephesians 6, 4, we see Paul calling us to fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord, or even 1 Timothy 3, 4 through 5 that says, he must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity. But if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And I know that's referring to an elder's role, but it's a very practical section of scripture. Now this list can go on and on with all the reality 
that it is vital as a father to be present in your children's lives. For you see, godly fathers lead their families by example. And the only way to be a good example is to be available for your kids to learn from you. We must be willing to take a stand and train up our families to know the Lord. Especially today, it is taking up a stand. We're becoming the minority. We must be willing to take that stand. We must be willing to train up our families to know the Lord. You see, a great way that we can do this is by openly displaying your faith in God to your family. Don't keep your faith just private to yourself. Express it out to your family. Let them see you walk with the Lord. Helping them to understand the wisdom of putting their faith in God and showing them how a loving and personal relationship with God can save their lives as well. You see, we train up our families to know and follow the Lord because fathers, it is our responsibility. It's not the world's. It's not society's. And it's especially not the government's job to guide our families. See, as fathers in Christ, as as the heads of our families, we are the ones responsible to help our children and our family draw closer to the Lord by living out our faith throughout our actions within our influence that we have with our families. That's why God constantly was telling Israel, teach them. Teach the next generation to know me. But sadly, they would fail, and then eventually there would be a generation that doesn't know God. We, likewise, as fathers, as the heads of our families, need to step into our role. We need to to remember how important it is that our faith, our actions, and our influence shine out Christ to our families. This is only possible if we're present in our children's lives. You see, the enemy, he's very crafty. And he has not stopped trying to rip our rights as parents right out of our hands. For if the enemy can diminish a father's role in the lives of his kids, it is much easier to manipulate and draw our kids away from the Lord. So as godly fathers, we must wake up, be present, and seek to be One's, one of the most prominent influences in our kids' lives and families. See, Keith Myring once explained that one startling bit of research conducted by the Christian Businesses Men's Committee found the following. When the father is an active believer, there is about a 75% likelihood that the children will also become active believers. However, if only the mother is a believer, the likelihood is dramatically reduced to 15%. Now, this study is in in no way, it's not diminishing the value and importance that having a believing mother in your home is. I mean, just ask any Christian who has had a loving mother, and I guarantee you story after story could probably come out about just how great and important her impact and faith was upon their lives. However, what this study is massively highlighting for us is just how crucial a dad's faith and influence is upon his children. If Satan had it his way, none of us fathers would ever live up to the calling the Lord has placed upon us. Therefore, I can't stress enough just how important a father's role is. You see, fathers, it's your faith, your example that sets the atmosphere in your family. For you see, your family is constantly watching you and learning from you. We kind of alluded to a little bit of this in Sunday school, where we were talking about leadership roles and how it's oftentimes the leaders and their poor management of following God that leads others to be harmed. They can't even come to God. It's very similar in our families. As the head of the household, as the, as the leaders of our families, fathers, Our kids are learning from us. So what's their actions and their attitudes and their their desires in life showing? Are Are we being good fathers? Do they want to know God? Do they even want to, to, to ask questions? Do they feel like they can ask questions? Those types of things. Our kids are looking for godly leaders. They're looking for guidance. 
Russell Lawson once explained how a young pastor in Ohio also worked at, at a feed processing plant in order to make ends meet. Each night when he went home, his boy would look at him and said, boy, dad, you are sure dusty. He would grumble to himself, but then smile and say, yes, I sure am dusty. One Saturday morning, as he was washing his car, he looked over and saw his oldest son, four years at the time, beginning to pick up small stones from the driveway and rub them on his pants. The father asked, what are you doing? I want to be dusty like you, dad, came the reply. As the pastor was telling the story, he said, at that time, I realized that if a son would look up to his father for being dusty, he would look up to dad for anything. What a responsibility. Fathers, it's this young pastor from Ohio, he hit the nail right on the head. Fathers have a massive responsibility and it reaches further than just bringing home the bacon. You've heard that before. That's the man's role. He goes to work and brings home the bacon while mom does everything else. I hate to break it to you, that's not how it works. That's part of it. We provide, but we also gotta be present in our children's lives. And the Lord is calling us as fathers to be present in our children's lives. That way they can come to know and follow the Lord just as we do. That way their generation can come up and do the same and teach their kids. We must refuse to stand by and let the enemy and the false promises of this world sneak in and take hold of our wives, our children, our brothers, our sisters, and anyone else who could one day become part of the larger family of God. The example that a father brings into the lives of those around them is so powerful that you never know what the whole impact might be. That's the, the, the semi-scary part is we, we don't know how much of an impact we're actually making sometimes, even in the smallest things. But we as fathers can either lead our families and others away from the Lord based on our godless example, or we can draw them closer to Jesus because we choose to stand in and with the Lord. How much stronger would every church congregation be if every father and father-like figure chose to be bold and courageous enough to fully embrace the role Jesus has called us to. You see, this applies not only to fathers and father-like figures, but all who make up the church as well. We all must make the choice to reject living according to the ways of the world and the way the world defines parenting. Instead, we need to be will fully submitting to God's example of fatherhood so that we can begin mirroring God himself. He's the ultimate father. As it says in Matthew 5, 16, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your father who is in heaven. That happens when we mirror our heavenly father. What an amazing concept to know that we can all lead we can all, as the church, reach others, and we can all impact people for the glory of Christ. Godly fathers must be present in your children's lives. And let me even, I'll tweak it for a minute. Christians, be present in children's lives, especially those who come here. It doesn't matter who you are. You might not have kids. So you're not father by definition, but in the church you can be. In church, you have influence. All of us do. So that one day, we can impact our kids and lead them to bless others in Christ as well. So in order to live out 1 Corinthians chapter 16, 13, and 14, it is crucial that not just fathers and men choose to be present in your children's life, but the church as a whole serves a massive role in bringing up the next generation to know, love, and serve the Lord. So keep that in mind. Sear it to your hearts as we move on to the final key point for today, which is don't listen to the world. 2 Corinthians 4, 1 through 4 helps us to understand this point well when Paul says, therefore we have this ministry 
As we received mercy, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced the things hidden because of shame, not walking in craftiness or adulterating the word of God, but by the manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In, those case, in, the, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is in the image of God. Simply put, we don't listen to the world because Satan is the one blinding the world from Jesus and his salvation. That is why we see society crumbling all around us. That is why we see attacks against godly families that have both a mother and a father who are desperately trying to raise their kids up to know the Lord. Or why we see birthright facilities being attacked. Sin is at the heart of society right now. It's running rampant. It's always been there, but the mask has seemed to be pulled off. And because of that, we see our nation lifting up and praising homosexuality, transgenderism, pedophilia, drug use, sex outside of marriage, and abortion. And that's just a small list of the various sins that the world ultimately, the enemy, is pushing to be the new normal way of living. That should terrify everyone, that that's the new normal way of living. It's why it's like, what's the world I live in? That's not what I was raised to know. Satan is working overtime. And as Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, we are called to be sober of spirit, be on alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. And when you look out at society right now, he's devouring people like crazy. Satan is looking to devour anyone and everyone. So as godly fathers, in fact, just as Christians, it is important that we do not listen to the world. Instead, we need to turn to Christ, our Lord and our Savior. We need to grow in our relationship and understanding of who he is and how he calls us to live. We need to mirror Jesus' image out into the world so that others will turn from sin and repent. You see, the world is on the broad path. That's the easy path to walk. But we as Christians, we're called to stay on the narrow path. Have you ever been on a narrow path when you're out hiking? Sometimes they wind around, you, you end up backtracking a few times, you go up steep areas. Oftentimes you can only walk one foot in front of the other or you'll hit the edge and fall off. That's the narrow path we're walking. We gotta be alert to walk it. So when the world seeks to draw us away, we instead need to be bold and stand on the truth of Christ, becoming lights and salt in the world with the hopes of drawing the lost to us. We're trying to pull people off that broad path and into the narrow path. We don't listen to the world because we are called by God to draw others out of the world and into salvation and a relationship with Christ. It's why we're told that we are not, this is not our, our home. We're like aliens wandering in a foreign land because our home will come when Christ returns. When the world demands we conform to its lies, we need to be like Peter and the apostles who said, while facing down the high priest in Acts 5.29, we must obey God rather than man. Fathers and father-like figures, church, we are to live in the world, but not be of the world. So we don't listen to the world when it calls us away from God and into sin. Instead, we stand with Christ as the example boldly and unashamedly always reaching to share the truth in love and peace. Fathers, don't underestimate the influence you have in this world. Sadly, our role is being trying to be diminished. But don't ever underestimate the influence you have. In fact, every one of us who are a part of the family of God are called to join the fight. It doesn't matter if you're male or female, old or young. You don't have to be a parent to step 
into the role God is calling us all into. There is a place for everyone in the church. And we talk about the various different gifts. Those gifts help us to lift each other up, to lift our kids up, to help each other when marriages are getting rough. To give godly advice to help walk each other through. We can be, all be fathers, mothers, grandfathers, grandmothers, brothers, sisters, friends. We serve a role. And God's calling us to step into the role. With that being said, allow me to tie this all together and come full circle back to our main text today. 1 Corinthians 16, 13 through 14 says, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith, act like men, be strong, let all that you do be done in love. To summarize these two verses, even shorter, basically Paul is saying we need to be prepared for the battle. This doesn't just apply to fathers or men, even though it says act like men. Well, okay, if you're a, a, a woman, I would just change, act like a woman. Exactly how God has created you and stamp it into your role. But we can all be alert. We can all stand firm. We can all have faith. We can all be strong and we can all do it out of love. So we all must put on the armor of God so that we can be a threat to the enemy. We become present and get involved in children's lives so that the enemy will flee them. And we don't listen to the world because only Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. My friends, the battle is raging on, and we have been given our orders. The question is, what will you do? I had to ponder that question quite a bit. What will you do? We have been given our orders. What will you do? Will you answer the call and be prepared for battle? Or will you stand by as the enemy devours those that we love? Finally, it hit me, and I think the answer is clear. And I think Joshua said it best in Joshua 24, 15. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Just like with Joshua, my family and I choose to serve the Lord. My prayers and my hope for today is that likewise, you will all join with me and choose the Lord as well. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity to dive into your text and see just how important the Father's role is, to see what you have called us to. But Father, in the larger sense, we just thank you as Christians to be able to see how there is a battle raging on and you have called us as, as your sons and daughters to, to step in and begin engaging with the enemy. Not through our own power or our own strength. We'd be utterly destroyed if that was what we did. But through your strength with your Holy Spirit living within us, with your armor on, so that we can finally become the threat the enemy is not wanting to see. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be bold in this world that seems to just be crumbling around, all around us, falling down and not having good moral ethics or, or seeking you in much of any way, but seeking the dark forces, the, the forces that you say we're at battle against. Father, help us to be light and salt. Help us to have love be at the very center of everything we do so that we can please help us to draw more into you. Because that's really what you are calling us to do is to, to, to seek out others, to let them know that you love them and that there is a way for them to be saved. Help us to be bold in that, to never shy away because of what the social standards say, but to stand up and say, I love Jesus and he loves you. We love you, and it's in your heavenly name we pray, Christ. Amen. So at this time, I'm going to ask if the praise team will make their way forward, and I get to offer an invitation. And before I do that, I want to just explain. I know what I was talking about really sounds militant and can be scary. It's really not when we join together as the body of Christ and walk through this battle together. This is a safe place. 
If you need to make a decision because you haven't been stepping up to your fatherly role or even as a Christian, embracing and following the Lord as he has called you in the roles that you play within the church. If that's the decision you need to make, make that decision. That's a heart thing. Repent, say, Lord, I've been sorry, help me. Come to him, he will come. If you happen to be here and Jesus isn't Lord of your life and you would like him to become Lord of your life, you would like to join God's family and you would like to have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit living within you, giving you the strength to, to make it through each day with walking with God side by side. If that's the decision that you need to make, you're welcome to make that. Anytime we sing this song, you're welcome to come forward. I know I said we're not having cookie hour or business meeting, but if you're wanting to get baptized, I think everybody will stick around. We can, we can fill up the, the baptismal pretty quick. That would, that would be a fun Father's Day gift, I think, to our ultimate father, letting him know just how much you love him. So if you are ready to make that decision, you're welcome to come forward, forward during this song. The rest, will you please stand as we sing this song? got some trivia and it's all about fathers who was the father of david what jesse solomon was david's son whose father was so pleased to see him that he gave him the best robe and killed the fattened calf what Think back Sunday school. The prodigal son. <laughs> Who stole her father's household gods? Yep. Who was the father of James the disciple? I'm hearing some Zebedee's. James and John, Zebedee's dad. The Sons of Thunder. That's such a cool title, but, but it was probably because they, they were too quick to want to kill everybody. <laughs> Jesus had to teach them some grace. All right, um, I got a couple prayer requests here. Um, 
prayers for, we, we prayed for this down in Sunday school, but I'm going to pray again. Um, prayers for Rick Warden. He had um, a head injury with skull fractures in a four-wheeling accident. He is in Portland in the ICU, and he's the dad of, of five kids. So we need to be praying for, for Rick Warden as well as his family. Um, Dan's asking prayers for our family. So prayers for De- the family because Dev's dad went to Christ a week ago, um, Friday, and thank God for his life. And also, here's a praise. Um, praise that they will be... or praise and prayers that they will be a positive influence as they are now certified foster parents, which is a prayer for, for you to be a great influence, but praise God that that all went through. That is a, a great thing. So please be praying for them as they're getting ready potentially for some journeys coming on. Anything else? I know we need to pray for Dick, continue to pray for Dick and Karen as well. Again, Wednesday is the day we'll know more on if he's able to have the surgery yet or how, when that's going to happen. Um, prayers for Dale. He's still sitting over there um, with his ankle. He, that, that will heal. And Sam seems to be t- doing pretty good from his um, surgery that he had, but also just prayers that that continues that way. Anything I may have missed? He has a, a cancer on his eye, and we may stay overnight for another specialist. I don't know if they're going to treat it or not, but please pray for my neighbor. Okay, so Candy's having to take one of her neighbors to um, get, he has cancer on his eye. He needs to get that taken care of. He's going to be staying overnight, so prayers that everything will go well with traveling and also that the doctors will be able to figure out what the next step is. Okay, prayer for the firefighters. Yep, that's a good one. Anything else? I have praise for the people that help fix the pipes in our house. Okay, <laughs> praise for those who worked on the pipes. <laughs> I appreciate it, and I really appreciate it. And uh, I just appreciate everybody that's helping us with the repairs. Okay, and prayers for the continued repairs because the, the ceiling and things like that need... Um, Sheet rocked and things like that. So yes, continued prayers. Is there anything else? Nope, I'm going to steal this so that I don't forget anything. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you again just to first and foremost thank you for being our Father. And, and as our Father, you, you call us to come and bring our um, prayers and our petitions before you, Lord. So we come before you. Um, we want to continue to pray for Rick Warden and his family. Um, he's in the ICU. We just pray that your healing hands will be upon him. Um, uh, if, you, if it be within your will, Lord, please miraculously heal him. If not, please work through the doctors. Um, make them tools within your hands. Father, we also just pray um, for... Dan and Deb's family, as they deal with the loss of her father, um, it's never easy to lose anybody, but it's always a good thing when we know that we'll see them again in Christ, when we see them in heaven. Father, I pray that you'd be with them during this grieving time, that you would strengthen them and put your peace and your comfort around them. And I also pray, we praise you first and foremost that they get to, um, they were certified to be foster parents, and we pray, Father, for them as they continue down that path that you would help them to be a positive influence on whoever the children are that, come to, that you bring to them, Father. We also want to pray for Candy's neighbor, um, who's on Wednesday going to OSU. He has cancer on his eye. Again, Father, I pray for healing, um, that you would have your healing hands upon him, and you would also use the doctors as tools within your hands for figuring out what might be the next step that needs to happen. I also pray for them um, traveling as well, that you would keep them safe. Um, Also, we pray, Father, for all the firefighters. There's fires going on all around in the country and all around us, and we pray that you be with each and every firefighter who's um, faithfully and diligently fighting those fires to keep us safe. Um, And also, um, we just continue to pray that you would help um, Georgia be able to get their their house um, 
completely finished and back to the way it was, Father, we also just ask and um, say thank you for for just those within the church who are willing to um, step up and help when um, there is a time of need. There's not just with their house. There's been so many here that um, are within this congregation helping with Dick and Karen, um, with everybody that seems to have an issue or an ailment and they need some help, whether it's providing food or just somebody to talk to. We thank you for this body that we get to be a part of the part of here that um, they're so willing and and ready to, to love each other when the time calls, especially when um, sickness is upon us. I pray for Dick and Karen. As um, Wednesday comes up, I pray that the, um, the infection in his um, body will be too, so controlled that they'll be able to move forward with the surgery that Dick needs. I pray that you just keep your healing hands upon him, your peace, your comfort, and your strength on Dick as well as his family. Be with them for traveling as well. They're coming to try to be with their father and their mother. Lord, I also just pray that you continue to be with um, Dale and Sam and helping them to go through this healing process, Lord, that it would be successful. They'll get back to their normal selves, able to do the things that they want to be able to do for you, Lord. We love you, we praise you, and it's in Christ's name we pray, amen. We please stand as we sing this final song.